All right, so one of the great things about The Chosen so far has been that we have seen all over the world people come together to talk about Jesus, to love the show because they love Jesus, and uh, coming from all different faith traditions. And there's good news and bad news with that. So the bad news is, is that a lot of times they come to the fan club on Facebook and they go, I love this show. And then someone else says, I love this show too. And they say, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be here. You're a Catholic or you're evangelical or you, you're in the wrong church or whatever. Um, the, but the good news is, is that by and large, we have seen so many people coming together going, oh, it's, I didn't know much about your faith tradition. And it, oh, think about all the great things we have in common. Uh, we have tons of people every day saying, uh, evangelicals saying, I, I want to now start practicing some of these uh, Jewish traditions and, you know, Shabbat and uh, uh, dinners and th some of the prayers. Every day we have eight people asking, where did that prayer come from? And, and just exploring more. And I've, I've met so many exciting new people as a result of this show. So one of the things that we've done from the beginning is we've had Rabbi Jason Sobel, uh, who has been our Messianic Jewish, is that the right term? Yeah. Messianic Jewish rabbi. Uh, consultant for biblical and historical and cultural uh, accuracy that we try to do as much as we can. And then Dr. Doug Huffman, who was my uh, Bible professor in college. So we go back way. So a little biased. Uh, I tend to lean in his direction more often than not. And then uh, we have a newcomer today, uh, uh, Bishop Robert Barron, who is replacing uh, for this uh, section, uh, Father David Guffey, who joined us on the first season, uh, who's wonderful. And uh, uh, but you're taking over for him today. He couldn't be here, unfortunately. But uh, what we like to do is talk about how the stories of Jesus are sometimes seen through a specific lens, that sometimes Catholics see Jesus through a different lens than evangelicals or than Jews. But it's, at the end of the day, the stories of Jesus tend to be what we all agree on. And so what we're going to do is go through each of the episodes of season two and talk about some of the things that stand out from a biblical, cultural, historical perspective, and then also from a faith tradition perspective, if there's anything that's unique to one faith tradition or not, and talk about even some of the things that we see differently uh, and explore some of those things. So episode one, we'll just launch right into it. Um, I'm definitely curious to know your thoughts on our opening, because the opening of episode one which uh, starts in the future from where our story normally is. And we don't actually tell you right off the bat what it is. You tend to pick up the clues from the fact that they have old age makeup on. And, and, uh, but what, as, as the scene continues, you realize that they're at essentially the funeral, as we would call it, for Big James, uh, who was uh, confirming, yes, the first martyr, correct, of all the apostles. And I believe, uh, the, at least tradition says that he was martyred in 44 AD. Is that about 41 right? to 44, something 41 in the 44 area. Yeah. AD. Mm -hmm. Acts so, chapter 12. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, right off the bat, I was curious, because um, this is a, from what the research that we were doing, the traditional Jewish, uh, it's called Shiva or Shiva. What's the correct pronunciation? Shiva, sitting Shiva. Shiva, okay. Um, so in their accents, they said Shiva because it's, you know, the, the kind of the Middle Eastern accent. But how did we do on that. I mean, we didn't show a whole lot of it. it was, they were just being interviewed. But the, the, the scene is the Apostle John is getting a head start on some of his writing. He's taking notes, essentially. Now, first things first, I believe uh, there, there is some debate over the book of John, whether it was written by the Apostle John or not. Most scholars believe it was the Apostle John, but that it was written not, it wouldn't have been written around this time. It was written much later, correct? Yeah. Uh, it's usually thought of as the last of the four Gospels written, maybe into right. the 90s. So, yeah. yeah, and that he was writing it, he wrote it on the island of Patmos, correct? Yeah, someplace um, in what we call modern Turkey today. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the idea that we were doing was he's not writing it, and he even says, um, I'm, you know, just getting notes down, because we're all together, and this is, you know, as we know, all the disciples after Jesus sent them on the Great Commission all spread out. And so we thought, well, what could kind of get them back together? And he's like, I got to get some notes down, I got to get the eyewitness accounts. So talk about what, what does Shiva traditionally look like? What was happening back at that time? Yeah, so I mean, basically, it comes from the Hebrew word meaning seven, mm -hmm. Sheva in Hebrew, mm -hmm. because there's uh, the first seven days of mourning are the most intense. There's an 11th month or one year mourning period. You have the seven days, 30 days, and then up to, up to a year. So basically, the focus at the funeral is on honoring the person's memory and on comforting the mourners. And so this idea of comforting in the mourners is a very, there's a lot of wisdom in the Jewish mourning practice because I feel like a lot of times uh, 
we don't go, we don't have a, many believers don't have a process or a ritual by which they can move through the different stages of mourning, sure. which is, is something very powerful, the recognition of, of how to mourn and go through this process. But basically, uh, some of the things that it would include is that uh, you wouldn't wear makeup, you would rip your clothing, uh, you would, if you have any sort of mirrors or any sort of things where you can see your image, you kind of cover those up because the focus is, as seen as vanity, the focus yeah. is not on kind of your appearance or on looking good for other people, but it's really on, you know, going through the grieving process and you shouldn't be concerned with your um, appearance. So we actually got, there were a couple people who were somewhat uncomfortable with how drab everyone looked. In fact, there were some Catholics, we heard from some Catholic viewers who were not, didn't love how Mary looked a little bit drab. Um, because I think in the Catholic tradition, Mary is a little, tends to be a little bit more bright and, and pure and happy, but that would have actually been much yeah. more accurate was that she would have been right. almost intentionally so. Absolutely, right? you would definitely tone it down for a funeral and even the, from the food you eat would be very simple to even mm -hmm. sitting on floor or low stools, uh, avoiding certain aspects of comfort. You wouldn't wear makeup and anoint yourself. So it's really, none of that would have happened. So I think it's a good, good portrayal. Yeah. And then, so uh, what people were at first when they were watching the scene somewhat confused because they're saying, why is she calling him son? She's referring to, and, and they were, okay, that's John, but why is she calling him son? And that, of course, comes from the moment on the cross. Jesus' own words from the cross, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Mother, so, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. Yeah, so uh, that was, again, a, another subtle clue that we were trying to, to give to people of what it might have looked like. And so in, uh, that's another question I had is, when he says that on the cross, mother, behold your son, and vice versa, she would have gone and lived in his house. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he would have been responsible for taking care of her and providing right. for her. I mean, for a woman in the first century to not have sort of a male influence and provision protection would have been would have been difficult situation. Right. So you always have notes, I think, <laughs> just everywhere. Uh, I think it, when I said we're going to get together to talk about the show, you probably like, oh yeah, I've got my notes right here in my back pocket about it. Uh, did anything stand out to you about that opening opening? Story? Well, I I love the um, these little subtle hints about John taking notes, getting ready to write his gospel account. But even in the conversation between John and his adoptive mother Mary. Um, the, the little hint about, well, I'm not in a hurry. Don't, you, know, you don't have to produce this book right away, which is a wonderful nod to that, the fact that he's the later of the four Gospels. Um, but also uh, her comments about you, you, you can't write down everything. If, if, the, if you were to write down all the stories about Jesus. You know that if you tried to write every single thing he did, the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Well, that ends up being a disclaimer that occurs at the end of the Gospel of John. And he kind of says, oh, yeah, I should say something like that. So it's kind of a fun thing in this episode. The ending of the Gospel of John is mentioned at the beginning of the episode. And then I love how the episode ends with John deciding how he's going to begin his Gospel. So I, I, I love that little turn artistic turn there for people to discover as they're watching. Yeah, it's certainly not factual that Mary was the inspiration for John's line at the end of the Gospels, but it, 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 we, we, we like to say our, our number one operating principle, which is what we'll talk about through most of today in our, in our episode breakdowns, is is it plausible? Because not everything is factual. We'll talk about even some of the things from this episode that are uh, not necessarily according to the gospel account, which we'll talk about uh, when this actually took place, when the Sons of Thunder were called Sons of Thunder in Samaria, which wasn't actually on their first visit. But uh, the question is always, is this plausible? And I thought, yeah, it's plausible that Mary could have said something about uh, Jesus' words and that John would have then put that into his gospel. So uh, then we get to the... the can, can I go of say course. something about that opening scene? Because it really struck me, of too, uh, from a couple of angles. One, about the John-Mary relationship, because... For us as Catholics, it's very important that Mary is mother for John, but then by extension, she's mother of the church. She's right. mother of all the disciples of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So one of her great titles for us is, you know, Mater Ecclesia. She's the mother of the community right. gathered around Jesus. And I like how that, not only in that scene, but throughout the 
series is kind of emphasized. But the other thing is, and you as a, as a New Testament scholar will relate to this, when I was going through school, so in the, say, late 70s, 80s, and the historical critical method was all in vogue, and the idea was, you know, well, these things might have happened way long ago, but then many, many years passed, and then the Christian communities, you know, kind of concocted stories and put it together, and who knows the connection to what really happened. And I, I was always uneasy with that, you know. It's as though everyone that knew Jesus after the resurrection just got a spaceship and flew away, you know. <laughs> Where in point of fact, all these people who knew him and loved him and, and saw what he did and heard his voice, they didn't disappear. They were there talking about it. They were preaching. They were exchanging stories. So, you know, whether it happened the way you portray it, who knows. But it reflects, I think, a great truth about the first Christians. Of course they remembered and, and exchanged information and right. tested story against story. No, it didn't happen that way. And if someone was named, you know, right. uh, Bartimaeus or Nicodemus, and well, they're, they're still around and we could talk to right. them. So I like that um, emphasis. Yeah. And I think it overcomes a certain, oh, sort of instinctual skepticism that, that was right. too much in vogue. And uh, I, agree. Yeah. I mean, why not? Of course these people remembered vividly. I remember reading some time, Someone said, well, you know, the Gospel of Mark, let's say, written around 70, so it's 40 years after the events. How could it possibly be historically accurate? And I thought, a book about the JFK assassination written around the year 2000? So what, that's just a, a, a tissue of lies? It's just fabrications? Come on. Come on. I mean, so I like that. I thought the scene expressed that fact pretty well. And one of the things that struck me, too, is that I love the way you framed it, because I think that John is really one of the most Jewish of the Gospels with these really subtle right. allusions. And, you know, he writes, I wrote this, that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And one of the interesting things about with the way the book ends and the way it closes is that he's really trying to show Jesus as the greater than Moses. Mm -hmm. So the Torah begins in the beginning, you know, but what people don't get when he says all the books of the world couldn't contain these things, what they don't understand and what they often miss is that it's actually an allusion to the very last chapter of the Torah, mm -hmm. which says until this day, to this day, no prophet has arisen in Israel who God spoke to face to face and did all of these unique signs and wonders that Moses did. So him concluding the book at that frames it in the sense that he is the one we have been waiting all this time for and the miracles He's done more than Moses. It's, I think, one of the great strengths of the series, the Jewishness of Jesus, and the, the Old Testament antecedents are so important. But, you know, when Pope Benedict wrote his great trilogy on Jesus, he takes that very seriously. The prophet like Moses who's to come, that's the hermeneutical key for Jesus. So uh, when you miss that, and a lot of people today do miss it, that's when Jesus turns into one more spiritual teacher among many. When you extricate him from his Jewish background, then you get a very distorted Jesus. So I, I love that about the chosen that insists upon his Jewishness. Yeah, I mean that's we talked about that from from day one. As I said, I want to make sure that we are not, I don't know if whitewashing is the right term, but we we we, we need to lean into that. Uh, partially because I think it makes for a better show. I mean I think it, I think some of these details that we try to insert into the show are educational, but also interesting. Just just strictly from a uh, and we'll get into that too, talking about all the prayers that they did and all of the, the dip, that they still do, but all of these things that, that emphasize his Jewishness. Um, I think that we, we do a great disservice when we forget about that. And you and I were in Israel talking about that very thing. And, uh, and I think that was, that's one of the, the, the main foundations of the show. When the Orthodox rabbi walked past us. Yeah, yeah, and it was like, <laughs> he's, not, yeah, he's not the Messiah. Yeah, he was, he oh, was, was angry. Right? Yeah, we were, we were talking about, about the Jewishness of Jesus and how important that is. And an Orthodox rabbi walked by and yelled at us. Let's talk about why it's important that Jesus is Jewish in order to be the Messiah. Yeah, absolutely. The scriptures make Jewish, it very clear. See, we hear that. See, someone walks by, he's not Jewish, he's not the Messiah. Even now, there's still debate about this. <laughs> so, speaking of arguments, um, this whole first episode is rooted in Samaria and the differences between the Samaritans and the Jews and the historical, uh, is hatred too strong of a word uh, back then? I mean, back it then there was quite hatred, a bit of... A deep enmity. A deep enmity, <laughs> yes. Um, so talk about that a little bit. What was the, and let's first be clear. So in terms of accuracy, um, we essentially combined two stories from uh, the book of John uh, that took place in Samaria. So the first one is Jesus has the ex encounter with the woman at the well, goes into uh, Samaria, spends three days, and many believed, even without seeing miracles. 
Um, that, in fact, they specifically said, it's his words that, that, that we believe. So we have that moment in the, in the scene where Fotina, uh, who's the woman at the well, keeps talking to everybody and saying, he's the Messiah. And they're like, we got it, we got it. We, 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 she we've, plays it wonderfully. Yeah. Right. Um, we've, we've, we now know, uh, just based on his words, that he's the Messiah. Um, but then later in the Gospel of John, they go back to Samaria, and that's when there is resistance, right? And, and John um, and James, that's when they say, let's call down fire from heaven to, you know, to, to burn these people up. Um, that's two different um, visits, right? And, and the first one where we ended season one um, was they were leaving Capernaum and going through Samaria. The first visit with the woman in the well actually was the opposite, right? They were coming from, I believe they were coming from Jerusalem. From south. So, and, and that's the woman at the well story where it ends them going into town and that's where season two picks up apart from the flash forward teaser that you have at the beginning um, is they're in this little village. I think you're using the name Sychar for the village um, uh, in the region of Samaria. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to talk about the tension between the pure blooded Jews as they would think of themselves and the Samaritans who uh, there's debates, of course, about the, um, the history of the Samaritans, but one of the more popular stories is that they are half-Jewish descendants of uh, their forefathers who intermarried with non-Jewish people, and therefore they're tainted people, so much so that the Samaritans were looked down upon in, in Jerusalem and to worship at the temple, so they had to set up their own their own worship center um, and their, their own customs. They ended up with their own version of Torah. And, and you could say some more about that, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, the big points of tension was, number one, where was the central place of worship? And so what you wind up with is the Samaritans create their own version of the five books of Moses. It's called the Samaritan Pentateuch. Mm -hmm. There are 6,000 differences uh, between the Masoretic text, which is the main Hebrew text that's used, 3,000 of those are not super significant, but there are several significant. The most significant is in the Ten Commandments. And the central thing in the Ten Commandments is that it talks about establishing a house of worship on Mount Gerizim. Mm -hmm. So, and we see that with the story in, in John 4 with the Samaritan woman. Where is the place to worship? Is it in Samaria on Mount Gerizim or is it in Jerusalem? And that was such a huge tension because the f defining marker of identity for Jewish people in the first century was the temple and your allegiance to the temple and you prayed towards the temple and you gave the temple tax to support the temple. So to say there was another place of worship, I mean, that's like, it's, it's you know, trying to undermine the whole structure and of course the change in the text. So that underlied a lot of the tension. So at the end of the episode, when they are looking at the five books of the Torah, and they talk, Jesus and John talk about how this is the only, that's all they have. That's accurate. But the Torah would have still even looked different. Would have looked it, different. It, it wasn't even officially Torah. It, 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 it would, it, di there's a different script that it was written in. Um, and, you know, I think it's questionable whether they would have read the text because it was a corrupted text. So was they, were they, would they have been supporting a, what they would have seen as a corrupted version right. of the text? Um, there, the Samaritans did have synagogues. They didn't have rabbis. They had priests. Right. But which I think we, I think we said you, you, yeah, he's the priest. We said that? he's the yeah. priest yeah. of his car. Um, but yeah, so that would would Jesus have actually read from their version of Torah? Debatable. Um, but the, the the what he did read, which is kind of the the in the in the beginning, was uh, would have been right. biblical. Right. I don't I, I don't know that. That particular passage is one of the debated no, it's six thousand. Yeah, so, it's it's, no. and we looked into that. Text. We thought that yeah. seems to be the safest passage yeah. for Jesus yeah. to have read yeah. Yeah. in yeah. the beginning. Yeah. And it made that wonderful parentheses with the way you began the episode and the ending and John and yeah. Right. So I, I love Jesus' little throwaway remark. Yeah, let's let's do the reading from about the beginning. It's a nice memory for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just love that. And that's he also gives the I am who I am, right? <laughs> right. Well, that's the that's the the main moment uh, and one of the themes of of the show is the whole fully God, fully man. Yeah. Uh, we believe that Jesus is God, the, the, the Son of the Father, and when he says I am who I am, he's declaring his. Well, the his fact godness. that he says this ultimately sublime thing, but with kind of a, a little sly, you know. 
it's, it's not a joke, but I mean, it's sort of told in a sly way that, and I thought it was very clever to convey both the divinity and the humanity of the Lord at this very sublime manifestation. I am who I am, but kind of like a little wink, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, He's, he says it as a as a normal person, as opposed to a right. like he doesn't step onto a stage <laughs> John and, and gets call it, out though. to it. he gets well, it. and that's the moment as John yeah. stares at him like, because that's a big deal. Yeah, what is what yeah. is uh, that phrase in in Hebrew? Yeah, Asher, Aya, Asher. I mean, you know, so Aya, Asher, Aya. So I mean, so yeah, I mean, it it would have been a big um, would have been a big moment, you know, saying that I am the one that the name that Moses is uses in the burning here's in the burning bush that God speaks to him basically saying I always was you know mm-hmm. past present and future yeah. so it was a, the I am statement is our, our big statements but it, it ties back to the first in the beginning because in Hebrew in the beginning Bereshit can be read not as in the beginning but it can be read through the firstborn God created the heavens and the earth so even the word in the beginning there's an allusion to the Messiah. The rabbis even see see within that that based on that verse is the world was only created for the sake of the Messiah. So there's a there's a messianic or christological implication in the very first word of Genesis one, which John picks up in one. Yeah, and yeah, clearly the apostle John is struck by this theological revelation in the Messiah Jesus. Uh, his is the last of the four Gospels written. The other Gospel writers don't emphasize that enough for his desired emphasis. So he begins his Gospel that way. And what this episode does is gives us a plausible background for how that revelation could have occurred to John in such a way that it mattered so much that I, he had to write it down. And, and all the I am statements in John's gospel, I am the bread of life, I am the good yeah, shepherd, seven I of am them. the gate, yeah. I am, you know, so the I am who am got into his psyche in a deep way. Yeah, yeah, and so this is a wonderful, plausible yeah. interaction yeah. between the two of them in this episode, yeah. One thing I wanted to ask about uh, briefly is there's a scene about two thirds of the way into it where Jesus visits the home of Melek, uh, who is a, a fictional character in the sense that we, we invented his name and invented his backstory. Um, and at one point, his wife asks Jesus about, you know, we, we believe that the Messiah would bring an end to pain and suffering. And Jesus says, In this world, bones will still break. Hearts will still break. But in the end, the light will overcome darkness. The notion, it, it, it's one of the most common um, Google searched questions in the world, which is if, if there's a God, why is there suffering? Um, I know that in the Catholic Church, uh, there's a theology of suffering in many ways, almost more than other, other faith traditions. Um, how did that scene strike you? Um, when, when it's a, it's yeah. certainly a, a question you've been asked Thousands oh, gosh, of times. Yeah, thousands of times, yeah. I mean, it just struck me as the famous already but not yet quality. I mean, so right. in a way, yes, the kingdom has come in Jesus. Yes, the Messiah is here. Yes, redemption is on full offer. But it's also not yet. We're, mm-hmm. we're awaiting the fulfillment. Mm-hmm. I remember over the years in dialogues uh, with Jews, we often come to this point because Jews will say, well, he clearly is not the Messiah because when the Messiah comes, justice will reign and, you know, the... Um, uh, goodness and truth and light will prevail, and so that clearly hasn't happened. And then our answer, I think, is something like the already not yet, you know, that in the resurrection of Jesus, yes, indeed, it has arrived, but not in its fullness. And I would say as a Catholic, I mean, that's now the, the task and mission of the church is now to move forward under the direction of the Holy Spirit to bring about the fullness of the kingdom, you know. But uh, so I read it that way, that mm. yeah, it is here in a way, but still, as you say, bones will break and hearts will break and suffering remains. But it's been in principle conquered through the dying and rising of Jesus. Mm. Yeah, and, and we, uh, in, in the Christian world, evangelical world, we talk about that a lot, that oftentimes suffering is what draws us closer to Christ mm. and that, it, that we don't see it always as a, as, a, as a bad thing, that it can oftentimes be a... You know, the, for, for, and I've experienced this in my own life, the times when I was closest to God, the times that I was closest to Christ was when I was struggling with something. And that if I go too long without some sort of struggle, I almost, I start to become self-reliant. I start to become pretty confident. Yeah. I get comfortable and, uh, and then I start straying. And, and it's through, the, through suffering that, 
that oftentimes um, I'm drawn closer. What did, what, how did yeah, I, just, I, I, I think, you know, God creates the world tov, he creates the world good. So I don't think, like, God wants to, the Lord wants to make us suffer, I, but I think he uses our suffering for good, right? He works all things out together for good, which I think is, in, like, I don't think God gives people cancer to make them more spiritual, right? So I, I think that's an important, in my opinion, point to clarify. But I think there's this idea of tikkun olam, of kind of repairing the world. And this idea of man is created in God's image. We're image bearers. Mm -hmm. We broke the world through our sin. But now we are responsibility to partner with God in repairing, healing, and making the word whole and proclaiming the good news. And I think that's part of the grace and goodness of God that he could have done it all himself. But part of, part of his blessing to us is that he invites us into this partnership with him to be part of the process. Which yeah. is something we can actually get into in the season finale when he's talking to Matthew about the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying, I want my people to participate in the healing of the world. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought of that when um, Bishop Barron just made his comment. This, um, as the philosophers call it, the problem of evil. Why does bad stuff happen if there is a good God? Um, I think it's interesting. People often um, don't realize this, but the story of Jesus is God's answer to the problem of evil not only in the already not yet entrance uh, and beginning of the kingdom, it's already rolling out here with Jesus and his uh, immediate first followers, but he embraces the problem of evil fully himself on the cross, right? I mean, here's the most perfect human who ever lived and he dies um, and suffers. So God's not avoiding the problem of evil. He is participating in it in order to conquer it. So sometimes we forget that. Christians, I, I tell my students, I say, look, the problem of evil is the biggest complaint against Christianity, and we as believers in Jesus should be prepared to talk about it. Yeah, and that's but we're, we're not, not alone. alone. I mean, Jesus, Jesus says, says something, something about, about it, it right. with his, the way his, his, his life, life went. went. Right, so we don't try to resolve it in a purely philosophical way. So we can say with Augustine, you know, God permits evil to bring about a greater good, and this is a legitimate principle. Mm -hmm. But you're right, the deepest answer is on the cross itself, when the Son of God goes into God-forsakenness to find all of us who have wandered into that dark place. I, I always follow Hans Urs von Balthasar, the great Catholic theologian, that because of what happened on the cross, as we run away from the Father, we're running into the arms of the Son. So that's the purpose mm -hmm. of the incarnation, it had this downward trajectory all the way into God-forsakenness. That's how we're saved, you know, so that's the, that's the answer to the problem of evil. It's not just a philosophical. Yeah. I think it's an important point because the Lord doesn't ask, God doesn't ask us to go through anything that he himself wasn't willing yeah. to go through, yeah. Yeah. right? And I think we often talk about the cross, but which you alluded to, the incarnation is as great a sacrifice yeah. as the cross. Hmm. He emptied oh, himself, wow. took on physical form. He experienced Every, he experienced sickness, loss, weakness. We, you allude to it and we talk about right in the episode when Mary's talking about, well, she was shocked when he was born because you know, she had to clean him, right? It's kind of this humiliation, this shame. How could God, you know, and, and, and the incarnation. He, he needed me. He that needed me, how, right? how could he need me? If and he so the incarnation is a huge sacrifice. God taking on human form, tying himself to humanity, now inextricably bound. Um, it's, it's very significant, and it's the answer to the problem of evil is the incarnation and his death. So we had our, um, some of our biggest fans ask a couple questions that they wanted uh, answered in these discussions, and so one of the questions, we'll close with this um, from 201, uh, episode one, is uh, from Sandy. She says, in the Samaritan synagogue, what was the rock that was placed on the scroll before Jesus read from it? Was that actually a Samaritan practice, or was it added for some other reason? We had, we've had a couple questions of people talking about uh, the opening of the scroll and that how even in modern tradition they, they wear gloves um, uh, when, when uh, handling the, the scrolls. Uh, some people had thought that we had, we had a couple of people who said, oh, I don't think that Jesus, at one point I think his hand touches the paper or something, and they said that wouldn't have happened. Um, we had, from our perspective, um, there were a couple reasons. One was we, we, we did actually say this was a different scroll in Jesus's mind than normal. He would not, he might not have treated it quite with as much reverence as he did, as he would have otherwise. But having the rock on the, the, the scroll, um, the, what's, what's the, the pointer thing? It's called the yod. Yes. 
uh, the yacht. Um, what in our research, what we uh, saw was, uh, and, and I'm eager for you to correct me, but uh, was that it's, it's less about not getting anything onto the scroll, but it's more about the cleanliness of the hands, not having the scroll and ink and stuff like that um, uh, get the hands uh, dirty. What, what's, what's, what's the well, kind of the, the truth there, of the there's a of the Well, there's a couple. I mean, there was a, a debate whether uh, ritual impurity could be, pa ritual impurity in many cases could be passed to an object. So if a person became ritually unclean, touch a dead body, mm -hmm. different things in the Torah creates a status of being Tom May, being unclean. Question of whether that could be transferred to a Torah. Ultimately, the rabbis say you can't defile a Torah um, with uncleanness. But, but there was a certain level of respect or reverence for the Torah that was part of it. But another very practical aspect of it was the fact that for a Torah to be used and to be considered kosher, fit for use, there could not be one blemish on the scroll, one piece of a letter missing, because you change one little bit of a letter, it could change the whole interpretation of the verse. So because Torah scrolls were written on parchment, on vellum, uh, with, with, you know, in, in ink, the hands, the oil in the hands can actually erode the writing on the scroll. So it's a very, so that's a part of the reason why you read it with a yod, you never touch it because you don't want to you know, rub away or to, you know, cause an issue with uh, the writing on the scroll. So part of it is reverence and respect, part of it is just practical to making sure that uh, you don't diminish any of the letters. And uh, you know, real pragmatically, right, the space hadn't been invented yet. I mean, words were written just one right after another, no space between words. And so to keep track of where you're at, you, you'd want some pointer of some kind so they use a sterile one. Yeah, and, and also because when you read the Torah, there's always someone, it's called the Balkare. I mean, there's someone who's following along to make sure that what you are, because there's no vowels in a Torah scroll, right? So that means that you have to have it memorized, you have to know the context of it. So there's someone following along to make sure you read it correctly. So they need to know where you're at. And they'll correct you, even today in the synagogue. If you say it wrong, they'll stop you, correct you, and you got to read that again to make sure there's no confusion of what's being read. Are you saying there's occasionally arguments in the Jewish community? <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, where there's three Jews or six opinions. So. <laughs> uh, anything else that, that uh, stood out as pressing to you from that episode? That, that uh, I, I liked the, uh, the use of of the Good Samaritan story um, with the character Melek, who turns out to be one of the criminals in the Good Samaritan story. And uh, that, that was wonderfully uh, done. That, that parable shows up only in Luke chapter 10. And I think it's interesting that Luke does not use the word parable to describe it. Jesus just jumps in and starts telling this story about this traveler. And so this provides a plausible backstory to right. where this story, uh, this parable teaching of Jesus uh, later on uh, came from. So I, I thought that was a really fun tweak. Yeah, it, it's, it, it could have been a true story. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Or we... Maybe we'll follow up in the other ones, but you know, the opposition to Jesus, that theme is so basic. I think of a great Catholic theologian, John Courtney Murray did a retreat one time. He just talked about the agon, the struggle the increasing struggle as he moved through the Gospels. And even from the very beginning, even the Christmas stories are stories of, of struggle, you know. But we have to watch that. When the Word becomes flesh, well, he enters into our sinful human condition. And so there's going to be, from the beginning, opposition to him and from all sides. Yeah. So at the end, there is abandoned by everybody, practically, you know. Right. So just that theme, I think, has developed well and as the... Well, that's season two, really, is yeah. uh, with the fame comes... Yeah. Good things, people are right. coming to be healed and redeemed, and now yeah. they're getting a lot more opposition yeah. than ever, and that's, that's key. But we start with a, the place, Samaria, where you'd expect the most opposition, mm -hmm. but where they were actually the most mm -hmm. receptive uh, in, in that three-day period that we, we, we cover in the Gospel of John. Yeah, and I love how you just bring in the show and giving people a glimpse into some of the Jewish prayers, like in this one, there's the Mo Ani what you say upon what you say in the morning upon arising, thanking God for putting your soul back in you. And I think there's a real value of, of Christians understanding this kind of tension between fixed and free 
type of prayer, which is, I think, interesting to explore. Yeah, we do that throughout the season is, um, and we try to not do it in a way, we try to do it in almost in a casual way like that, right. that, that this is just part of their life. So they wake up, um, uh, say their prayer as even almost, almost as a matter of routine. You know, they right, say the right. prayer right before uh, they're about to, in, in season one, before they drink the wine, you know, they right. had the blessing of the wine. That's been fun. And we've, uh, we've, we were saying this before, um, before we started talking here on, on, uh, for this video was how we're hearing from uh, so many people uh, who want to, to do some of this stuff. They want to start mm -hmm. living. Or traditional Christians might discover, oh, so that's where that's why I grew up saying a prayer right before I ate. Right. I just I didn't know that it has this long of a history. And yeah. Well, I think that's one of the the quote unquote weaknesses of the evangelical world is that we strayed from, in some 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 good reasons, of course, from some of the rigidness of religion. But that's where I think the, the Catholic tradition and the Jewish tradition are actually quite similar. With, with, there's more ritual. I'd love and to come back to that theme as we go forward because yeah. I think there's a very important connection there between Judaism and Catholicism yeah. especially. And, and I think we sometimes, as evangelicals, because we rejected some of the rigidity, have lost some of the good stuff about yeah. it, which is yeah. the, the, yeah. The, 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 the practice of it, the discipline of it.